righty, Lena, we are at six o'clock. All right. You're ready to get us started. Yeah. Sounds good. Thank you all for joining tonight. Uh, thank you to Katie for agreeing to be our um, get to know your grower part one. Hopefully we can expand and we meet some others. Um, Katie Ross of Night Song Native Nursery in Canton, Georgia, which she runs with her husband, Ed. Um, so yeah, we are going to let Katie tell us some stories and we definitely want to thank her for supporting our uh, native plant sales and coming all the way up to Chattanooga a few times from Canton. I'm sure that was a harrowing uh, adventure coming up the interstate, but um, but yeah, Katie, if you want to start out with just telling us about yourself and how you fell in love with natives. Sure. Um, so yes, thank y'all for having me. Um, sorry, I'm not going to be at this fall's plant sale. <laughs> my, um, my husband's good friend's 50th birthday was res rescheduled for that date. And he makes a lot of sacrifices for the nursery. So I couldn't ask him to you know, <laughs> for me to not go to that. So, um, so we'll be going to that, but I will definitely be there in the spring. Um, so let's see where to start. Um, the, let's see, I've been in horticulture since I was 18, 19 years old, um, close to 24 years, which is really weird <laughs> to think about that. Cause in my head, I'm still like 25. So I don't know how I've you know, been doing it that long, but, um, but I've uh, worked in regular nurseries, selling non-natives for most of my career. Um, I got out of horticulture and went back to college, did my, uh, uh, my master's degree in education. I started a second master's degree in clinical mental health. Um, my interest is, um, uh, working with uh, special needs kids and uh, nature therapy and ecotherapy um, and adults too. I mean, we all need ecotherapy, um, but put that on hold once I had my daughter and we ended up moving back here to Georgia and uh, just said, you know what, we need to We've always talked about it. My husband's always heard me talk about starting a plant nursery. Um, I remember one of our first dates, we talked about it. <laughs> so he had plenty of warning that that was gonna at some point might happen in our marriage. Um, and uh, so, so yes, yeah, so we moved back here and just went with it. We just decided to start the nursery, so. How did, how, what was that process like as far as starting? I'm sure. Did you jump in into the deep end and you just start propagating here and there? Um, how did you get to where you are now? So that's a really good question. So my background is mostly retail, um, but I also, you know, I've also, whenever I would travel anywhere, I go to all the botanical gardens and, you know, study uh, plants from all over the country. And while we were living out west in Arizona, um, Scottsdale, Arizona had a native plant, um, uh, what's it called, where they, you're, you have to plant native plants, you have to replace what you've removed, whatever that word is. <laughs> so, and like in my head, I was like, wow, that's really cool. That makes so much sense. Um, but, you know, I hadn't really considered just doing native plants because you know I love I love all sorts of really cool rare stuff um but uh so starting the nursery I had a little knowledge of propagation but really my knowledge was mostly in just running a nursery so um I really had to learn quickly how to propagate and really once you get it you kind of got it you know it's like you once you know stratification you stratify your seeds once you learn which species don't need it you don't you know and you just kind of keep moving on um I don't do a whole lot by cutting just because I do like the genetic diversity of of, of seeds um, but I do a few things by cuttings, especially obviously if it's a cultivar or something. 
Um, but yeah, propagation was my biggest uh, learning curve, I guess, to try and figure out. Um, but yeah, so I, I just kind of jumped in with that and ran with it. It was, it's, you know, it's something I felt like it always kind of was meant to be. Um, and I had a feeling that if I just continued to move forward and do what I thought was right, you know, growing plants that are really, really important, things that are, you know, serve such an important part of the ecosystem that I couldn't do wrong. You know, I mean, you can't do wrong when you're growing something that's, you know, a native plant that's needed, you know, um, I mean, you can grow. <laughs> there are some native, wrong native plants, but you know what I'm saying, like as a whole. Um, so yeah, so I just kind of jumped in and started doing it. I like that. You can't go wrong if you're growing natives. We need a T, that should be a t-shirt. <laughs> you can't go wrong. I like it. <laughs> I bet some people could come up with some things that you could grow wrong, though. <laughs> yeah, probably, but, you know. <laughs> um, what have been some major breakthroughs for you when with propagation? So what has been, like, the brass ring you're going for as far as something that's difficult to propagate? And maybe you got it, maybe you didn't. But what has been an interesting journey on getting a plant to, you know, make it? Um, growing Franklinias from seed, that was really something exciting to me. Um, uh, I'd say some of the Asclepias were, are kind of, you know, a little more challenging, like the Exaltata and um, some of the ones that you don't really commonly see in nurseries. And there's a reason why you don't see them in nurseries, because they're hard to grow. They're harder, well, they're harder to grow in a container. That's the big thing. Like you can get something growing and if you put it in the ground, it'll continue to grow. But if you try to leave Asclepius tuberosa in a container through the summer, it's not gonna look good. Ours look terrible by now. So um, that was kind of, uh, you know, that's kind of a struggle. A lot of, um, a lot of the ephemeral stuff I think is more challenging. Getting it really the bit hardest part with that is getting it through summer and then through winter. Um, you know, obviously spring is fall, it's, you know, you plant them in the fall or you plant them late, late winter. They grow, they're wonderful. Um, there's a lot of rot and there's a lot of loss to animals um, digging them out. And <laughs> you know, so. Um, I would imagine with the ephemerals, you know, you have to have faith that once they have came through the first time that maybe they will come back because you know they don't hang out all all year like a shrub would so right yeah we do a lot of dumping dump it into your hand see if there's anything there oh okay yeah <laughs> not one year i lost over a thousand plants because i kept stuff too dry through the winter and because you know in my head with us here in georgia um, for winter, it's not the, the cold that we have to keep things protected from. We have to keep them protected from the wet, from rotting in the wet. And so I had them in our dry house and I was just like hard set on keeping them bone dry. And they were in this uh, pine uh, composted uh, pine mixture that just, just was hydrophobic. Basically the water just went right off. So it, so like, and everything just, it just, you know. But I was also, that was also the winter that I had my son. So I gave myself a little credit that like, you know, I was a little preoccupied with growing a baby. So I didn't get too hard on myself, but, but that was a good, uh, a good lesson. I imagine, I imagine you have a lot of lessons. You should write a book or a pamphlet for others who <laughs> <Pamphlet>. <laughs> want to uh, begin learning. <laughs> <laughs> um, now the Franklinia is that the shrub that's down on the Altamaha River? Yeah, I'm not familiar with that one. Okay. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, well, I mean, people grow it all the way up and down the East Coast, um, but it it's was endemic to uh, the Altamaha River, but uh, it's now extinct in the wild. Program on that. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. 
Let's see. So along with your challenging natives, what is your favorite native or family of natives? Um, and not necessarily just in the nursery, but for you personally. I think it depends on the time of year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like summertime. I love the floxes. Um, I love uh, the milkweeds. Um, fall, I love trees, obviously. Uh, winter, I'm, I, you know, I, I was actually talking to a friend of mine the other night about winter time, you know, and so many people get, you know, seasonal affective disorder where you get really sad in the winter time. And, you know, I think if people could stop and really admire the structure and the gray and the, the lichens and the mosses growing on some of these trees and just get more, you know, up close, then maybe some of the seasonal affective disorder, you know, I mean, there's so much alive here in Georgia and in the Southeast. I guess, you know, if you go further North, everything's covered in snow for the most part. But um, down here, you know, there's just so much beauty in winter. Um, so in winter, I've really come to admire the mosses um, and lichens. So spring, everything, obviously by spring, we're all just like, wow, we're all <laughs> crazy, loving everything. So yeah. Excellent. Let's see. And of course, anyone else who has a question, just type it into the um, text box down there. We'll get get to you. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. So Katie, you and Ed, where do you see your yourselves in five to 10 years in your nursery business? Are you, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people ask me a lot, like, what do you want to do? Do you want the nursery to get so much bigger and, you know, no, I don't ever see myself being a North Creek nursery or, you know, any of the really huge nurseries. I love staying small to a point where I know my customers and I like handling every plant. I like being able to, um, I like being able to, to, to know like what's going on in the nursery. I feel like if um, we got too big, I wouldn't be able to really do that. Um, but I also on that note would like to continue to get help from the people that work for me who are awesome. I'm not sure if they're listening right now, but they're awesome. Uh, and we're going to try and grow more trees this year. Um, I'd like to expand on growing more trees, larger seven gallon, 10 gallon, 15 gallon stuff. We've always stuck with the three gallons. Uh, some seven gallons uh, but I'd love to I'd love to be able to grow more trees um, maybe limited wholesale we do a little bit right now but I, I don't really want to do too much wholesale um, uh, but yeah I, I really like still being able to be a part of it. You know, I felt like when I did go from running the nursery by myself and hiring my first employee, it was a little, it was a little weird. Cause I was like, wait, how do I know that you're doing everything like I would do it? And then you have to learn that they're not going to do it like you do it. They're going to do it differently. And sometimes they're going to do it better. And so, you know, letting go of that control, but I like that being involved in the daily, um, you know, walking the nursery, seeing everything grow. Because if I'm not doing that, then, you know, I'm stuck doing paperwork and then sitting behind a desk and that's not why I'm in horticulture. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's kind of where I, I'd like to get, I'd like to get a little bit bigger. I'd like to spread out a little bit more. I'd like to start bringing in other, um, I'd really like to grow in a way that we're doing other things with the community um providing a space for people to come and experience nature that's really important um so yeah i'm sure that's a fine line to walk between controlling everything but then letting things go but still knowing what's going on because at the end of the day i mean i've talked to you about plants before and you're like this is my baby um you know this one i think i can't remember it was the Asclepius perennis, 
And like, here's this beautiful, and there's a caterpillar on it. And now it's yours to take care of. I'm like, yes, ma'am. You know? <laughs> so I really like that. Um, you know, I feel like we're pretty lucky with the nurseries we do have come up because, I mean, y'all know these plants are a part of you. You nurtured them from a seed or from a tiny being. Um, right. So I feel yeah. like that's a one great of the thing. one of the first people that worked for me. She was like, "Do you actually want to sell your plants?" Because I was like, "Uh." like oh yeah I guess that's what I'm here for is to sell these plants but they are kind of like your babies yeah but you know at the same time when I sell a plant to somebody like you and you're like oh oh, I've got this magical little thing with this caterpillar on it you take it home and you're going to give it a lot more attention than I can give it because I've got you know thousands of plants to deal with so (laughs) so that's good (laughs) Bill has asked how much seed do you collect from the wild or where's your source um, and where do you collect your seeds or get your seeds? That's a good question. So I'm always, always, always trying to get as much local ecotypes as I can. Um, it's really, really hard to get every species or, you know, I mean, what am I going to do? You know, if I grow, you know, spotted horsemen, I'm not going to drive down to the coastal plain and, you know, so I, um, I do try and get as much as I can here in Cherokee County, especially right now. This is like drive around and see what you see on the roadsides kind of time. Um, uh, Anytime people want to donate stuff like locally sourced, I'm always super, super grateful. Um, You know, some things I do have to buy in because there's just, you know, just have to do it. what was the other part of the question? Um, let's see, where, where do you source your seeds? And if you do get them from the wild, is there a percentage of when you collect from Percent- the wild? Percentage I collect and leave? Like the seeds <laughs> or whatever. Right, yeah. Like, take it, take it, off. Some I take it off. No. <laughs> Better than the road crew would do, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, I don't take it all. I don't, I was just kidding. Um, you know, I try to take as little as possible, obviously. Uh, it's almost to a point where if I'm growing something, we'll, you know, spring will have like, oh, look, I got, you know, 75, 100 of this. And then it's gone by May. And then I'm like, okay, well, I need more seed because I already grew all those out. Um, so I'll either just order in a plant, you know, a plug or something because I never know what to expect. Um, you know, if one year beauty berries huge and I can't keep beauty berries in stock. And then the next year I've got beauty berries coming out my ears because nobody wants to buy them. Um, so it's just kind of, you know, a lot of it's sort of reactionary as to what plant I need to grow um, and source the seed, how much seed to get. So... Mm-hmm. Have you seen a trend? Um, I know we're talking more about native grasses and native sedges now. So I guess, have you seen that as a trend of people looking to buy a green ground cover? Um, I am still trying to push grass on people and they're just kind of like, ah, you know, sedges. <laughs> we're working on them. <laughs> good, yeah. Sedges, sedges are easy. People get for some, I guess, cause they're evergreen, they're shade, they're a fine texture. Uh, They're super easy. Um, People like sedges, but as far as the native grasses, also I think people, I tell them all the time, you know, you can just grow your own native grasses from seed, just throw the seed out there, you know? So, I mean, I I sell some, but not a lot. Gail is asking if you have a large sunny area are there any quote unquote bargain plants you would recommend? So Gail, I'm assuming you mean something that would maybe spread a little bit um, to fill in. Hopefully that's what she means. So what do you think? For a sunny area? Yeah. Um, well, grasses. Um, <laughs> mountain mint, Pycnanthemum muticum is like, you know, spreads like wildfire. Um, it depends if you're wanting shrubs or if you're wanting perennials, you know, you can do your Menardas and there's a lot of stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm a fan of the mountain mint. 
I'm like, I'm like, yes, take over. It used to be a pasture. Let's fill it in with something. And the bees. Exactly. I mean, it's not a sexy bloom, but the bees find it so, you know. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, gr I've seen it grown as a hedge where people use it kind of as foundation planting. And that looks amazing. You know, I mean, it's, you know, oh, well, is it going to be evergreen? No, but it's, you can leave it through winter, cut it down in the spring, and then you just have a little ground cover for, you know, a few months until it flowers again. And yeah, it's, it's an excellent plant. That's another one we can't keep in stock. Good. <laughs> I probably grew like 500 this year and still, I think I have like maybe 30, 40 right now. So I can give you seed. <laughs> oh, I got seed. <laughs> Gail also asked, what is the fastest growing native tree, especially in evergreen? So Gail, are you meaning for maybe a barrier for your neighbors <laughs> to block them out? Uh, I usually suggest like for sun wax myrtles. I mean, they're, you know, a large shrub, but that's a good fast growing. Um, also, I usually tell people, I think a lot of people have in their minds for screen type stuff, they need a Leyland Cypress or a Cryptomeria because, you know, in their mind, it has to be like an, a giant evergreen. Um, but, you know, I'll say, well, if you, you know, first of all, where are you looking at them from? Are you looking at them from your deck, which is up high, or are you looking at them from down, like at a fire pit and your neighbors are right there? You know, if you're down low, then you want something like, a beauty berry or um you know another like something else fast growing that's not that's going to keep a lot of lower growth um so i you know i think the whole screening concept is part of the um or at least the evergreen like cryptomeria type type thought process is part of that you know 1980s 1990s uh landscaping mentality that we're trying to kind of get people to move beyond um which is hard for me you know i i grew up in the in the regular uh, you know conventional horticulture world of planting um you know compact to hollies as your foundation plant and um so you know it's 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 hard for me to mentally move beyond that too so i get it like i get people thinking that way um I'm trying to get people to think more of using instead of having foundation plants being evergreens that, you know, there's other types of, you know, you can have layers of things and, um, you know, uh, you know, do you really need something that's going to be evergreen out by your fire pit if, you know, well, I guess fire pit's not a good because you are out there in the winter, but <laughs> if you're lit by your swimming pool uh, to screen out your neighbors, if, you know, you're you're not out there in the winter. So why don't you try something like a beauty berry or, you know, a dogwood or a service berry or something that's going to um, be beautiful and beneficial for several months out of the year, but maybe in the winter, not an evergreen. Angela is asking, what are your strategies for gaining buy-in from people who do not know much about natives or the significance of choosing natives over exotics. So I guess, how do you approach the education part of your sales pitch? <laughs> <laughs> That's something I need to work on, to be honest. Cause I've kind of gotten to a point where, and I was thinking about this the other day, I'm sort of spoiled with my clientele mm -hmm. because they already come to me with a certain amount of knowledge typically. You know, they, you don't go to a place called Night Song Native Plant Nursery typically when you've got like lows down the road, in, unless you're looking for native plants or you're looking for something different, you know? Um, one of the first questions I always ask people, <laughs> and it's probably too direct, but I'll say, well, do you believe in science? Cause you know, a lot of times they'll say, <laughs> they'll say, well, I don't know about that. Or my husband doesn't believe that, you know, this plant's gonna really do much or that, you know, this isn't like this. and you know, it's like, well, do you believe in science? Because the scientific, this, there's proof that, you know, these, this is what, how, these are the interactions that happen. And this is what the plants are doing with, with the insects. And, um, 
and you know, and some people, they just don't believe in it. So, um, but I am pretty spoiled. A lot of the people that come to me are already, have already bought in, they've already heard from a friend or they've heard from somebody else. And they're just like, so excited to buy plants. I have the, you know, I have the best customers every Saturday. I'm so fortunate. I get to see some of like, so, so many repeat customers will come. I've got a few that come every weekend and they're always like there and they're excited and they're happy. And that makes me happy. Um, and then I'll have new customers that'll come and they're like, I don't know anything about natives. I just know that, you know, I want them. <laughs> I just know that I think if I put them in the ground, they'll grow. And I'm like, well, that is true. <laughs> However, right plant, right place. And then, you know, we kind of talk about that and then, you know, they'll go home and they'll put whatever in the ground. And then a couple weeks later, they'll come back to me and be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. This plant grew. I've never grown anything. I've never gotten anything to grow. And I got, I saw these, I saw butterflies and that was amazing. And my kids got to see bees and it's like, that is the best. That is just the best. Having that kind of like energy from your customers. And I love seeing the kids come in and they're all like, wanting to help walking around with a little pot that's like as big as they are. And uh, yeah, I've got great customers. I'm very, very fortunate. <laughs> Hopefully their word of mouth will uh, drive sales and education. Yeah, I think so. I really do. I think, um, you know, a lot of people say, oh, my friend told me to come here or whatever. And a lot of it, a lot of people, they just, they don't, they might not, you know, they might not know what they're looking for they just want to come find something pretty and then they take it home and they're just so surprised that it lived um and it's not that's not necessarily because it's a native plant that is because you know i think um i think some of the large big box growers um really have done a huge disservice to the green industry um, and that they sell plants that say like a chrysanthemum, right? We all know everybody wants a chrysanthemum this time of year. It's got big giant blooms. Well, the new homeowner goes out and says, well, I guess I need to get a bunch of these chrysanthemums. And so they take them home and they're all excited. They've got this perfect, beautiful plant and they take it and they put it in the ground. And what's the first thing that happens? It splits. And then they're like, oh no, it died you know, oh, I, I can't, ki I, I kill everything, you know, like that's their fault. That's not your fault, you know, or a lot of the stuff, the annuals maybe are grown using um, fertigation, which is fertilizer mixed in with the water and mm -hmm. you've got a sterile soil and the plants, um, you know, so you take that plant off the, the drip the fertilizer drip and you put it in the nursery and it looks good for like a week and then it starts declining because the soil is sterile and they come along and go oh I love this little plant and they put it in their yard and <laughs> it's sitting in this peat moss and it just slowly dies and they can't figure out what they did wrong I must I must not have a green thumb I can't grow plants and they're done and so I see a lot of those people and they'll come to me and be like you know I, I can't grow anything and I'm like oh yes you can <laughs> you just need to start with the right plant and so we'll get them the right plant and then I start explaining to them soil you know and they're just like well I never thought about that it's like yeah soil's alive soil is magic I mean you know it really is it's got it's got it's just it's it's, an, it's a it's a living thing thousands millions of living things billions of living things in that container that, I, that you're taking home with you um and and their plants, they put them in the ground, they put the right plant in the right place, and then they're just shocked that the plant is alive and they're just so excited and proud of themselves. And they keep coming back because they're like, I want more, I can do this. <laughs> so I think that's pretty cool too. That is really cool. You know, we need, 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 need more people to care right now about nature, about, um, you know, not just growing plants, but growing native plants. We, nature, nature needs us to get these people involved, to get homeowners involved, to get them caring, to get their children caring. Um, so I, you know, I think that's one of the most rewarding parts of the job. That's a good point. It's almost, 
it's similar to um, technology and program obsolescence. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You plan it and then it's beautiful and then it kaputs. And what did I do? Well, no, it was programmed not. It was programmed to fail, so you could buy yeah. more. <laughs> exactly. It was supposed to die, so you go buy more. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, that's so, oh, that's it, okay. it makes you crazy. It makes you want to pull your hair out, you know? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> Let's see. Bill is asking, do you ever find any Native American artifacts along your creek? Where's the creek? Is it behind the goat pen? <laughs> well, you know we do. Um, no, the creek. So we have, a, we have a freshwater spring that runs in front of our house. And then it runs into Canton Creek that goes around the back of the nursery. Um, and yeah, we do. We find pottery, we find arrowheads, we find all sorts of crazy stuff. We found a little piece of a bead that, you know, it's not like a, not like a, you know, recent bead. Um, but we find broken pottery from, um, I believe it's from the middle Mississippian period. So a thousand to 1300 years old, it's called complex stamped pottery. We find shards. Gosh, I would I could have brought some down. Oh well, um, but it's really cool. My husband found a, a broken piece of um, my husband's brother's a an archaeologist for the state of New York, so it's real helpful. We can send him pictures and say, "What's this?" But um, he found like a perfect little piece of a a necklace that had a little hole, and he was like, "Yeah, that was." probably a piece of uh, jewelry of some sort. So it's it's pretty awesome. Yeah, and so we, you know, right here, there were lots of different places throughout this area that were the beginning of the Trail of Tears. Um, the, one of the beginnings is like less than two miles from here. Um, there's, you know, I, I've, I've gone and talked to the people at the Funk Heritage Center, which is a native, uh, um, research center uh, at Reinhardt College and I was so surprised when I moved here I was like oh my gosh we've got all this you know all this stuff and I, I feel like you know there's probably <laughs> people living here and he was like yeah there were people living there <laughs> but uh, we find um, you know we've got our pawpaw grove that I feel like it had to have been cultivated for it to be as just intense as it is for as long as it is um we've got mulberries giant huge mulberry trees and um but anyway yeah we love our property it's very special it's very fitting that you are um, now growing plants native to america on land that you know you're doing a great service to remember yeah a friend of mine said, wow, I bet the spirits are glad you don't work for a plastic company. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I guess they are, huh? It kind of works. <laughs> okay, our next question, speaking of soil, um, Big Bird, I'm sorry, I don't know your real name. <laughs> but anyway, um, she's moving to Gainesville, Georgia from Wisconsin, Ooh. where the soil is black and loamy. She's brought some of her prairie plants to her new Georgia home in Georgia. Shock of all shocks, she couldn't even break up the soil by jumping on the shovel. Uh, do you have any, com do you have to completely amend the soil to grow natives? So one of the first things I always ask people is what year was your house, uh, your house born? What year was your house built? Um, and a lot of the new builds, the topsoil scraped and sold. So you're left with the hard pan underneath. So you're not really looking at, you know, our soil. Our native soil is actually pretty good, especially walk out into the woods. You know, you've got really great, deep, loamy, good soil. Um, when you have a newer build and you're left with that hard, the, the clay hard pan underneath, then you probably will really need to amend it because you've lost thousands of years of work. Um, so yeah, you have to, you have to, you'll have to amend that area where you're planting. Um, it also kind of depends what you're growing. If you want to kind of do like successional type growth or, you know, planning for your yard, which most people do not, um, you can plant grasses. Um, they will create uh, soil quickly. 
Um, you know, every year they're perennial, they'll, uh, the bacteria breaks down, the um, years grows from before and you get a little bit more, but then you got to dig out the, the plant. But um, yeah, it, uh, soil is fascinating. If you want to come talk to me, big bird, <laughs> um, come talk to me about soil. I love talking about soil. <laughs> all starts there that's for sure it does yeah and that's the, really the thing people don't understand and that's the thing with being a grower you know when I first started this I didn't really I kind of took soil for granted mm -hmm. um not just the soil in the ground but the soil in the containers I took it a little for granted thinking well I'll just use composted pine bark and you know we'll just uh, I'll mix in some of this and some of that and every year, depending on climate, depending on what I'm growing, I'm changing my mix pretty much constantly. Um, and then the soil in the ground is just, it's really, really fascinating. And a lot of it depends on where you are, as y'all know, you know, and I know in Chattanooga, you could be up on mountain or you could be down below and it's your soil profile is gonna be completely different. And it's amazing because what we have here is just clay. But I mean, the frost asters, they don't care. You know, the, the golden rods, they're fine with it. Um, right. Yeah. So, and there's yeah. clay and then there's the hard pan. And then there's, yeah. Right. And clay, Georgia red clay has lots of minerals in it. It's not bad. It's good stuff. It's just, um, you know, depending on what you're trying to grow, you might need to add some amendment to it. Or if you're going to grow your frost asters and your solid egos, you're not going to need to amend it as much. Yeah, I'm, Quit going. I'm, It'll be fine. This is one of my favorite topics, but you don't need to amend your soil unless you have a good reason to. Yeah. You know, people say, well, what should I put in the soil? I said, well, look, the, the dirt you just took out. You know, the exception is if somebody's built your house and they've done something horrendous. But unless somebody has done that, the soil you're looking at is what's out along the roadside that everything's growing in. Yeah, I tell people they need to introduce microbes. They need to introduce, introduce microbes and mycorrhizal fungi. Those are really the two most important things for our success. Huge difference in dirt and soil. And I feel yes. like a lot of the, a lot of people don't realize that. You know? dirt Especially what you gardening, get on your food gardens, you know? Yeah, dirt's what you get on your clothes. <laughs> Soil's what's in the ground. <laughs> Okay, Katie, um, it's time for you to tell us about your harrowing experience with the um, carnivorous plants. <laughs> how did how did this happen? <laughs> so I think um, I might have offended a few people when I got upset. <laughs> <laughs> or they might have thought, oh, she's new to the whole carnivorous thing. I'm not new to the whole carnivorous thing. Um, I just had this realization one morning when I was in the nursery and I was standing there. I was just having an emotional day and I, look, I was standing there hearing the buzz inside of a Saracenia pitcher. And I was like, I can't do it anymore. I can't do it. I'm done. I'm done. So I um, ripped it open, let the little guy go. Um, I have immense respect for, for pitcher plant bogs. I visited them. They're amazing, very di diverse places. Um, I personally though, just having pitcher plants near my, uh, my pollinator garden was kind of like, what? That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So <laughs> I was like, I'm attracting things. And then this guy's like, yum. And I'm gonna bring them all here and plant them near my my goats. You know, I don't have a ton of pollinator stuff down here. It's mostly just trees and grass and goats. So I feel like that's, you know, but I'll have a little bog garden down here for it. But yeah, it was just, I, 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 I understand a lot of people love, love their carnivorous stuff. And I think it's fascinating. Um, but you know, it's the difference between being a vegetarian and being a carnivore, you know, it's just, it's just, it's to each their own, as long as you're not hurting anybody. Um, 
So that was that with the, uh, did you want me to bring up my little picture? Yeah, of pull up the ripped him out let's see let's go to you want me to do the screen share screen um all right oh is that doing it yeah uh i don't know how to make that bigger but <laughs> here he is he's like yay i'm free <laughs> <laughs> it's like, did anyone see that truck, that bus that just hit me and tried to eat yes. me? <laughs> and he was dazed for a while. He was like, whoa, what's going on? I was just like in this dream world. And I took him and put him on something and he eventually did fly away. So, um, yeah. So I guess we could look at a couple other pictures now if you want. Let's see. Here's a. Can y'all even see these? Yes. Okay. Oh, uh, this I took at um, the um, uh, reflection writing after y'all's last plant sale. Um, a little hike we were doing through there. I just thought it looked like I like the contrast there. Um, let's see, what's this? This I took the other day. Two fritillaries making more fritillaries. They were down in the um, uh, on our drive, like our uh, parking lot area, and they just let me pick them right up. <laughs> they, they did not care. Uh, so that was a cool little picture. Surfed flies. I'm not sure what y'all know about flies, but flies are amazing. I love this picture because I love the yellows are the same as the yellow in the Coreopsis. Um, yeah, so, so there's just a few pictures. <laughs> and, uh, Bill is saying that bugs eat bugs all the time, Katie. <laughs> So everyone has to eat and that is natural but me introducing them to a place they're not really they're not native to cherokee county so me having them here in cherokee county i just felt like i don't want to do it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> to each their own though so your pawpaw grove um so it was there when y'all moved, moved, moved up here or moved down here. Oh yeah, it's naturally occurring. Yep, yeah, yeah. It's 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 really really beautiful. Oh, and I mean, they're all oh. you know. Every, there's lots of pawpaw groves around here, I'm sure. And um, just ours is special because it's ours. <laughs> but it's a it's a fun it's a fun area. And I did a, I did a a post a lot of today, um on the uh, white egret that I found. When I was down there, this white egret just came walking up like a huge bird, you know, three feet tall, just was not scared of me, just was walking through, just looking at me like, what are you doing here? Get out of my way. I want to, I want to hunt where you are because we are down in the creek. Um, and I, I feel like there's just so many special things that happen in that area. It's really very diverse. There's, um, you know, we find so many different plants. Whenever I'm down there, I'm like, oh my gosh, oh, I didn't even know that was there. Um, we found, uh, I'm trying to think, um, there's a lot of cohosh. There's obviously pawpaws. There's magnolia tripetala. There's um, green dragon, azurum, um, not azurum, erysema draconium. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of different stuff that just kind of grows there. And I'm like, wow, it's just a really special, diverse area. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, anyone else have any questions? Feel free to unmute also. I actually have a very specific question, so what Katie. You... OK, go ahead. Um, so I bought a Leatrice from you but it is tiny. It is a small, and I can't, the tag is gone. So I'm not sure what its name is, but it, um, but it's like a very small ground cover, really. Um, it could either be Leatris microcephala, or I was growing, was it, when was it? I think it was last fall. 
It was probably microcephala. I was growing Liatris, what I believe is Pelosum. Uh, a friend of mine told me that that's what it was. Um, the seed was, I got here uh, right around the corner from my property. And it's a really small one, like. Yeah, it's um, it's like a miniature, like a little, it's like the, you know, teacup, po the teacup poodle <laughs> version of a, of a Leatrice. It's, it's, I mean, it, you know, maybe a foot tall, but. Did it have a lot of flowers? Did it have a lot of flowers? It's probably microcephala. Okay. Yeah, that's a cute one. I love that one. It does look I like a too. teacup poodle. It looks fluffy. <laughs> I know. I want more of those. <laughs> Duly noted, I will grow more. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what, oh, sorry. Um, Cody's asking, what is the most unusual native plant that someone has requested? That someone's requested? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I get all I get a lot of requests for different things. Um, sometimes people will request these, you know, really like you know things that aren't native but are you know hardly you know. I'm like I don't know what that is, and I look I'm like oh native to Asia. That's why I don't know what that is, and I don't grow it. <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't know. I one of the one of my favorite plants to grow that's kind of not super common is Brickelia cordifolia. If y'all been here, did I push some on you, Lena? I might have pushed some on you at some point. I know I pushed some on Bill. Um, and it's not native to Tennessee, but it's native to Georgia and Florida. Mm -hmm. um, and it's blooming now. It's a pink fuzzy, fluffy, looks like an ageratum, kind of like a, almost like a liatris, but it grows like a, a ageratum. It's pink, um, grows in the sun or shade. It's uh, deer resistant. Um, that's one of my favorite plants. That's my favorite, my favorite current plant. What was the name of that again? Brickelia cordifolia. Um, Fleur's nemesis is the common Ooh. name, and it's got kind of a dark reason for the name being Fleur's nemesis. From what I understand, the plant was being studied by someone whose last name was Fleur, and he passed away. So, while well, he was actively studying it, Right when I first started getting into natives, I went to the Georgia native plant sale and bought monkshood, which mm -hmm. I'm very surprised because it's poisonous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it's, is that one Wolfsbane? I'd read it like it was in a vampire book I was reading at the time of my youth. Um, but I was like, it didn't live where I put it, probably, thank goodness. But, um, but that was an interesting, you know, that's a, pretty murderous little plant so but that's beautiful beautiful but um I've never seen it again for sale <laughs> so yeah that's funny <laughs> yeah a lot of people in the you know kind of on that vein um you know ethnobotany and and medicinals and stuff people come to me and ask for stuff and I'm like I'm not giving any you know advice on that i'm not an herbalist i'm you know and i'm a plant grower and you know yes this plant has a lot of medicinal properties but that's all i'm gonna say you know like scutellaria is a great one or passiflora but you know take at your own risk <laughs> What is one of your favorite native grasses to utilize in a large area, like a former pasture? Um, Panicum's a good one. Tritons, um, the greasy grass, that one's so easy to grow. Um, uh, little blue stems, pretty. 
Awesome. I don't guess muley grass is really native to Tennessee at all, is it? It's more coastal plain. Y'all don't have any coastal plain last I checked. Um, but we don't, I don't, I wouldn't use that as a pasture grass. Um, purple love grass, air grostis. Um, that's a good one. Um, there's so many grasses that are, you know, right plant in the right place. You know, you can do a lot with them. Awesome. Let's see. What is your favorite book for native plants of Georgia or in Georgia? For Georgia? Um, I don't really have a Georgia specific book. I mean, I'm sure I have a bunch of Georgia books. Um, I'll do a plug on my friends using Georgia native plants website. She does a blog. Uh, her blog is using Georgia native plants. <laughs> um, and it's, you have any questions, if you Google something, it probably comes up with her blog because she has covered so much. Um, and she's, she's just a wealth of knowledge. Um, hmm. I don't really have a Georgia book specific. I do have a couple of books that I love um, talking about um, another thing I've been, I've been um, reading about a lot lately, uh, Edward O. Wilson. I don't know if y'all know him, like the most precious man. <laughs> I love him. I think we need to put him in a bubble. Edward O. Wilson, Jane Goodall, and Willie Nelson all need to go in a bubble until we get through the pandemic. Um, and Jimmy Carter. <laughs> and Jimmy Carter. Oh, gosh. Yeah, Jimmy Carter, too. But um, Biophilia, this is a book. Um, the whole concept of biophilia, I think, really is uh, applicable to everybody, probably on this call. It's the concept of um, it's just the love of life, the love of living things. And um you know humans are innately attracted to living things because we've co-evolved with living things uh with nature we talk about the co-evolution of insects and plants and you know but there's also the co-evolution of humans and plants and in nature overall and i think that um have having the interest that i have in psychology and, and mental health and all that i think really trying to get people to find that love again and or find it for the first time is gonna help see our way through a lot of the trouble that we're in right now. Um, a lot of the mental health issues for young people, technology and all that. Um, I think biophilia and the love of living things is gonna really, um, if we can get people to fall back in love or to, to, to just start learning about it and stop and just pay attention, really just stop and pay attention. I think that's gonna solve a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. um, but I love Edward O. Wilson. I love any of his books. Since we're talking about books, I have to plug him because I, I adore him. <laughs> I have heard of that book. Yeah, that he's one. written so many amazing books. I, I mean, I can't even like, there's no way I could read them all because I'm just not that intelligent. <laughs> he's, just, he's just like the most like amazing his brain is amazing um but yeah he, what, what other book do i have oh the future of life that's a great one so, so you just started or you just opened up for your fall hours correct so how can we carpool down well we'll have to drive separately so we can all get a lot of plants um but what will your fall hours be um we're open saturdays 10 to 3 through probably middle of November. It's usually when things start to slow down. Um, but we're open during the week by appointment and somebody's usually at the nursery seven days a week, except Sundays were closed. Um, but Monday through Friday, anybody wants to make an appointment, we're, um, we're there and I can always give good lunch references for people who wanna go have lunch afterwards, <laughs> make a day. <laughs> So yeah, just, um, I just asked for a heads up. So like an email, um, nightsongnatives at gmail.com. 
So at the end of the season, so in winter, how do you put your nursery to bed, I guess? So well, I guess we don't really, really get a lot of snow. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we're in Georgia, so we're yeah. year round, you know, right. I mean, we don't, we don't, we're, we're never closed. We're open year round. Um, just by appointment in the winter and, and in the middle of summer, because it's just so slow. Um, but somebody's there all the time. Um, but to prepare for winter, we do um, take a lot of the our perennials and things, and we put them into the house that one of the houses that I keep covered um, or that I do cover. Last year, I didn't close up the ends. I've never closed up the ends because we don't need to keep in heat. We just need to keep in, keep everything dry. I might consider closing up some of the ends this year. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's pretty simple. I mean, my goodness, I look at nurseries like up near y'all, like in Tennessee and pretty much anywhere north of us and all that they have to go through in the winter. And I'm, we're pretty spoiled. I've, I've left stuff out like, oh, oh, I forgot to put those away. And, you know, got down to eight degrees once. And I think I lost like a handful of things. Um, really the big thing is just keeping it dry. Um, when we have really wet winters, we'll have a lot of water come up through the ground. And that's really a problem because uh, the plants just soak that water up. So being dry from the top doesn't really do any good. Um, but yeah, we're pretty lucky. We don't have a lot of work or too much work. I say that, watch this year be like the, you know, the <laughs> snow apocalypse. Of the century. <laughs> it would be fitting, wouldn't it? <laughs> 2021 snow apocalypse. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else questions? I have a question. What does what do what do people want to see? Like, what more plants do people want? You know, like, <laughs> do I <laughs> question? <laughs> <laughs> or what's something that maybe you can't find somewhere that you'd like to be able to find? Is there anything like that? Berries, so feeding the birds, right? Sandy McGrew. Hey, um, Sandy McGrew. <laughs> um, sure, and, and feeding her too, right? <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> I know Sandy. She's here in Canton. Um, okay. <laughs> we grow a lot of berry stuff. We grow um, aronias. We grow obviously blueberries. Um, I'm gonna do some more Crotagus this year, the Hawthorns. Um, uh, service berry is just hard for me. I think it's hard for a lot of people um, just to get them, like once you get them going, I know everybody wants service berry, I can't keep them in stock. And the ones that I have look really puny and people still wanna buy them. Um, uh, Trying to think what else I have that's a fruiting berry. I'm sure there's several other. I'm happy to donate wild plum seeds if you need them. <laughs> sure, yeah. I always say I have some wild plums back here that my um, the birds ate all the plums. <laughs> okay, here's some here's some suggestions for you. Uh, anything that grows in Georgia. So I feel like you will be, you would be a great mentor to our friend Big Bird, who's just moved into town into Gainesville. So hopefully she can email you. Uh, Shrubby yeah. St. John's Wart, New Jersey tea. Yeah. Um, let's see. So the grasses that you mentioned, do you sell those or you said it was pretty easy to start from seed if not? Yeah, we sell them. We sell, I try to push them on people, even though, you know, and some people come in, they're like, oh yeah, yeah. You know, I'm like, plant your grasses with like, with like your goldenrods and your asters and they're just beautiful, you know? Um, so. Cornus alternifolia is one that Kate would like if you can work that up. <laughs> so which, that's a dogwood, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not familiar with that one. Alternate leaf dogwood. Okay. Elderberry. Um, yeah. We grow elder, elderberries. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's obviously another fruit we grow. Yeah, right. of course. Elderberries. 
Yeah, my um, college roommate grows a lot of natives and she made jam out of um, beauty berry. And I was oh, like, dude, yeah. how many billions of beauty berries did you have to use? It doesn't really have a taste, you know? Right. But it's very color. pretty. Yeah. It's so pretty. Yeah, it's the color. <laughs> yeah. Um, I did not know humans could eat those. So They're not very good. They just yeah, kind of I mean, taste bland. <laughs> It was just probably to say that she did it. <laughs> yeah, I bet it was what she shared. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, Calicarpas, and it's it's awesome. Um, it's native to Tennessee, yes? I would assume so. Um, uh, it uh, acts as a, the calicarpinoid is the chemical in the, in the leaf. Crush it up and rub it on your arms. Acts as a great mosquito deterrent and tick deterrent. Um, people used to stick the they cut the, the stems and stick it in their horses for keep flies off and it's it's a very good plant we'll grow in shade it just won't flower and fruit um but uh yeah calicarpa is awesome awesome we just need somebody to develop a dwarf yeah. I've and seen there's, a good topic. there's a good topic how about we talk about native cultivars because <laughs> I know I think Wild Ones just came out and said they're not for cultivars is that correct they did update their that. statement on uh, on cultivars and they're they will always promote um using a majority of straight species right yeah yeah um so my take on cultivars, not that you asked because you did not, <laughs> but I can okay. give it to you if you want it. <laughs> We're asking now. <laughs> this is your show. Yep. So native cultivars, um, I grow them. I don't grow the ridiculous ones. I don't think really any native plant nurseries grow many of the you know, crazy echinaceas and the double flowering things. Um, but we, you know, we grow the Jacob Klein Monarda didyma, um, because it is more uh, powdery mildew resistant. It doesn't it doesn't flop. Um, it's an excellent plant. Genetic diversity it doesn't have, but it does attract um, pollinators really well. And it's an it's it's a a lot of the cultivars are going to be. So one of the reasons we do grow them is their predictability. Um, a lot of my customers are living in HOAs and they're going to say, hey, you know, I live in an HOA and I need something that's tidy. And I'm going to say, okay, Coreopsis auriculata nana, grow it. It's easy. We know what it's going to do. It will still attract pollinators um, and it's going to stay small and tidy. Um, Phlox gina is a great one. That's one we grow because it is more powdery mildew resistant. Um, you know, there's there there are several cultivars we grow now. Straight species, yes, we grow to most every most all of our shrubs and obviously our trees are going to be straight species, um, and most of our perennials are, uh, you know, seed wild seed collected and and straight species. But there are the cultivars that are going to be easily predicted for HOAs and for people who need something more tidy or whatever. You know. Um, native azalea cultivars, those are a lot of them are just naturally wild selected, you know, cross pollinated, and there's so many cool ones. So I think, um, you know, some like Jacob Klein bee balm, for instance, that was discovered on the Blue Ridge Parkway. So it, it wasn't created, it's, it was found growing in the wild. Um, homestead purple verbena was found on a homestead in Georgia, I believe. Um, so there are the, the cultivars that we sell. So I, you know, I do think that, um, that the discussion of saying that, you know, no cultivar, you know, don't use cultivars is fine. Yes, of course, if you're doing some kind of a um, um, ecological restoration and, you know, yeah, don't, don't use <laughs> you know, a cultivar. But for most, especially my customers, they're all homeowners. And they're looking for something that's going to look tidy and nice in their yard and contribute to nature. And so we do sell cultivars. What I hear you saying is you do not grow the Ekebekia. 
<laughs> oh gosh, no. What is that? I just heard I about it. And Rebecca, yeah, I yeah, think I somehow that. they have uh, Frankenstein like, that thing. <laughs> what? Or the um or the uh what's it called? The Hucarellas. <laughs> nope, 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 no Hucarellas. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah. and Tiarella can cross naturally in the wild so yeah um, but yeah no I I do support the use of of the right cultivars yeah well you you mentioned Phlox Jenna um that one actually Mount Cuba did studies on and it's pollen and nectar um all of its counts and and its uh benefit to insects was actually greater than the straight right. species that they tested with it so right. yeah so it's it's hard to say um I, I know a lot of people use that tagline that oh only use straight species um but that can also be off-putting at times so so there's yeah there's a balance to be had definitely definitely yeah. yep Right, you know, it's like each customer is going to have their, 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 what they're willing to accept, you know. And if I can get somebody who is, you know, just planting Laura Petalum and Stellador daylilies, if I can get them to put some Homestead Purple Verbena and some Phlox Gina into their landscape, then I'm going to do it. Small steps. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yep. Questions, anyone? Oh, have you ever um, propagated blue eyed Marys? Is that from Bill? No, think but um, Charlotte, uh, um, Charlotte sent me some seeds and. Oh yeah, I'd love to get some seed because he. I think he said he had some seed and, oh, and really? like, I've never heard of that before. Oh. Or somebody, one of y'all said that, and I was like, I don't think I've ever heard of that before. And I looked it up and I was like, Ooh, that is that is a really pretty plant. Is it an annual or a biennial? I'm not sure. She has a huge, glorious patch in the woods behind her place. Um, so we're gonna see what we get. She was able yeah. to collect some seeds. Yeah. If anybody has extra seeds of a local ecotype, I will definitely, I will trade you for them. Charlotte, are you on? Her background is her blue eyed Mary, so she'll say something. Oh. I took a, I took a less glamorous picture. I was looking to see if I could spot it. Questions, anyone? Anything else you want to share with us, Katie? Words of wisdom? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I have too many of those. Um, <laughs> uh, no? Just, uh, yeah, I mean, y'all are pretty awesome. I really, really, really love the Wild Ones group. Um, I love what you're doing. I love your programs. You're so prolific. You just have so much content you're putting out there. And if that is just so cool. Um, I wish I lived in Chattanooga. Maybe one day I'll get a vacation home up there. <laughs> Uh, yeah, they have just recently started a Georgia chapter. Um, I think it's oh. North Georgia, maybe. I'm not exactly sure where. Huh. Let's see. Another question from Sandy. Do you think mulberry is a good thing to have? She's heard some negatives. Uh, the red mulberries, the native red mulberries, yes, of course, they're way, they're, that's an amazing plant. I love, we have mulberry trees all over and I love eating mulberries. Um, the non-native mulberry, the white mulberry or the, the paper mulberry, um, they're non-native invasive species. Mm -hmm. So it's just the difference between getting the right species. Morris rubra versus Morris alba, and I think the other one's Morris papyrifera or something like that. I think it's a paper mulberry. I think that's further south. Um, 
but Morris Rubra, the, the red mulberries are gorgeous. We have them all over our property. Excellent for birds and people. <laughs> all right, let's see. Okay, Cody says he thinks it's the Georgia Piedmont. So is that, let's see. Oh, the Wild Ones chapter. Awesome. Oh, well, okay. that's interesting. I've never heard of that. But Christina, that must be super new. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not sure that they're not still just a seedling. Okay. <laughs> a seedling. I like that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So when it's anyone. Terminated. They right. brought their eating seeds out. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So they start out <laughs> as seedlings. And then once they have enough members to charter, they become a, a chartered chapter. Oh, that's the real so, terminology. Sorry. Yeah. I was like, oh, that's cute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, apparently we did too. We thought it was cute too. <laughs> yeah, it was cute. <laughs> but yeah, thank you all for everything you do. You do amazing, amazing work. And I, I love, I love coming and seeing everybody and their energy. And um, I'm so bummed I won't be there this fall but I'll be there in the spring for sure with bells on. We look forward to seeing you and hopefully we can come down maybe this fall sometime on a weekend. Yeah. On a Saturday. <laughs> sure. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Let me know. I'd love to have y'all down. Mm -hmm. um, probably next spring we'll start back up with our um, ephemeral stuff. You know, we have mm -hmm. on the property, we have a, a pretty good diverse collection of ephemerals um most of them are naturally occurring here um so maybe we'll start that back up and um that would be fun but yeah definitely y'all come down and visit us excellent all right last call for questions everyone angela said thank you for sharing your insights and everything that you are doing not sure if you have the text box pull them, but um, I do, awesome. but I'm not wearing my glasses, so I can't. <laughs> I have to do this. I'm just squint. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you so much um, for you. sharing, and um, yeah, we hope to see you soon. Thank you. And thank you everyone for uh, tuning in today. Yeah. yeah, and if anybody has any questions, Gmail is uh, nightsongnatives at gmail.com. Feel free to send me an email. Katie, and thank any, you so much. And Lena, thank you for uh, handling all the questions and facilitating this meeting and uh, awesome. this informational thing. We appreciate it. 